Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. May it please the court. My name is Susan Taylor. I represent Mr. Aaron Ramsey. Um, the question before the court is whether the admission of uh, a ballistic certificate and two drug certificates were harmless beyond a reasonable doubt. And in this case, the Commonwealth has, has agreed that uh, <coughs> their admission was erroneous in light of Commonwealth, ver um, Commonwealth versus Melendez Diaz. Um, in this particular case, uh, the state of the evidence was that uh, the Commonwealth, in its case in chief, presented two witnesses. They presented the testimony of first of Officer Sierra, who saw Mr. Ramsey discard <coughs> a silver item. When Officer Sierra located the item, he said he didn't touch it. He was not aware whether or not Mr. Ramsey's hands had been tested for any. Uh, gunshot residue. He didn't smell it to see if it had been fired that evening. He said that he it indicated that the mechanism indicated that the gun was not loaded, but he went on to say that I'm not an expert in that gun, so I couldn't tell you any more about it. And at that point, Officer Sierra testifies that he takes Mr. Ramsey to the hospital and because he had been wounded, and he observes a nurse remove two bags of what appears to be crack, a bag of crack cocaine and a bag of powdered cocaine. And at that point, the government introduces the certificate and Officer Sierra reads from the certificate that it was sent to the lab for analysis on a certain day and that it tested positive for cocaine. The next witness is Officer Rodriguez. And Officer Rodriguez is the one who actually retrieves the gun. He inspects it. He says it's not loaded, but it does have a magazine. And at that point, they show him the ballistic certificate from the Massachusetts State Police. And he testifies that based on that certificate, it indicates that the gun was operable. And the question specifically put to him, is it capable of discharging a bullet? And he says yes, with no malfunctions. And at that point, the Commonwealth rested. And in this I thought somebody testified that the that the the group that the cartridges were the same was that no there was nothing about w w were there were there cartridges found at the scene at the scene that was that was in the government's rebuttal case but in the C commonwealth's case in chief they presented those two witnesses and those three <coughs> certificates and then they rested and at that point in that post verdi pre melendez Diaz world, um, the, although the defense counsel had prepared a motion for a required finding, he, he didn't argue it. He submitted it to the court, but he didn't argue it. Because those two witnesses and those three certificates, I would suggest, satisfied all of the essential elements. Now you've confused me. Is it your argument that the evidence was insufficient upon the close of the Commonwealth's evidence to support a finding that it was a gun, or is your evidence that, uh, in, view, in view of the totality of the evidence, including the rebuttal evidence tying the gun to those shells in front of the Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurant, that uh, it was not harmless beyond a reasonable doubt? Well. I don't think that it was harmless beyond a reasonable doubt. I don't know if the prior argument sort of foreshadows where we're going, but I, I think it's important that it, I think that it, it set, sort of sets the table for where we were with drug and ballistic certificates at that point. Because later in the trial, when defense counsel stipulates that the gun was operable and that the substance was cocaine, at that point... It's too that, late. Those elements had been presented and basically decided by the court. So, so are you saying that when we look at look at the harmless beyond a reasonable doubt, I mean that we stop at the point of the Commonwealth's resting, right? 
Well, I, I, certainly in, in the context of, in the, and excuse me, in the context of a uh, motion for a required finding, yes. But then it goes on, it, it, the defendant testifies. And in the defense's case, he testifies that he picks up the gun. He said it, it wasn't fired. He said he didn't shoot it outside. Um, it's, and that it's he, he discards it. The, there's, there's absolutely no dispute that he possessed the <clears throat> weapon. Now, at that point... And doesn't and, he and also say that, yes, I had the cocaine in my sock? Yes, he also said he had the cocaine in his sock. And it, what's, what's interesting is the trooper, Sheeran, the mass state trooper, the ballistics person who comes in and, and testifies, when the, when the judge asks the prosecutor, why are you calling a rebuttal witness, the prosecutor said, I'm calling him not to prove the operability of the, of the <clears throat> firearm, because I think everyone agreed it had already been proven, but he said that he wanted to dispute that the gun that was retrieved from Mr. Ramsey was the gun that was in the restaurant. So at that point, Trooper Sheeran testifies. Now, Trooper Sheeran did not test fire the weapon. Uh, Trooper Crane did. He's the one who signed the certificate. And although he testifies that the, there were two cartridges retrieved from outside of the restaurant which matched what would be taken from the gun, they're really, his, his testimony, and I... If, if you go over it a number of times, I mean, it does say that it was, there was no ammunition in the weapon that was seized. You really don't know where, he, he says that he got it from the test fire, but there's no evidence about how he got it, what were the basis for his tests, how did he test it, did he use microscopic analysis of the ballistics. The, it was really not aimed to that end. And at that point, when both sides do their closing argument, it's at that point that the judge says to counsel, um, gee, it really sounds like you've conceded uh, that the substance is cocaine and uh, that we're, we don't have any question about whether the gun was operable. And at that point, it's actually interesting because what the judge says is, uh, do you really want me to go through all these Elements. As a matter of fact, what he says is, do you want me to go through all the elements, you know, the, the whole thing, or do you want to just focus on necessity? And defense counsel says, I think you should go through all the elements. And then the judge says, constructive possession and actual, I mean the whole nine yards, the certificate, things like that. And, I, and at that point, Defense counsel talks to his, his client, and they say, no, Judge, we'll, we'll just focus on the issue of necessity. And is that ineffective assistance of counsel? Was that? No, I don't think it was. Not, in that, not at that time. And I, and I say at that time. Not at that time, you're looking back after a guilty verdict and saying, well, now maybe it was. Well, no, I'm looking back at a time when if you think that the certificates, if those three certificates established all the essential elements of the crimes charged, then I suppose just focusing on the necessity defense might make sense. But don't we look at the case as it was tried in its entirety when we talk about whether an error was harmless beyond a reasonable doubt? Isn't yes, I, I think, yes, and, and, and I think that the, the, the more recent case, the, the Como versus Mendes, and right. it's aimed more towards the admissions of a defendant. But in this case, at least as to the cocaine, um, Mr. Ramsey makes a conclusory statement that, this, that the substance was cocaine. But unlike Mendes, he doesn't testify that he's a regular user, that he knows all about it, that he can recognize it just by looking at it. And, and with regard to the, the operability of the, of the weapon, um, I think that in that case, I, th I, th I think you do have to look at the totality of the record. And I would suggest that if, you, if the court looked at the totality of the record, I just don't know how you you can necessarily come to the conclusion that the introduction of those certificates were harmless beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, do you agree that we may consider his testimony in evaluating whether or not it was harmless beyond a reasonable doubt? Yes, I, yes, I think based on Commonwealth versus Mendes, you, you can. I think if the so, court... 
I'm, I'm sorry. No, no, you, you go ahead. I'm <laughs> that if the court did not extend um, this is Cummel versus Charos, um, that you should that the fact that he testified doesn't necessarily taint whether or not you should consider what his testimony is. So yes, I do think that you have to look at the totality of the record in order to determine whether or not the admission of the certificates were harmless beyond a reasonable doubt. Did, did the judge give an, ins an instruction to the jury about the, the identity of the cocaine? Didn't he say something about that? Well, that, that's actually very interesting, and it's, it's almost in keeping with, with the last argument. And, and because what's interesting is there was no stipulation in this case. I mean, what happened, as a matter of fact, the instruction to the jury from the judge was the parties have agreed that the substance is cocaine and that the defendant possessed it. So, I mean, it wasn't even a, a situation where, um, I mean, what discretion does the jury have when the judge has just told you that, well, we all agree that Mr. Ramsey possessed the cocaine? You don't think that the discussion with the judge and then the client's discussion with the defendant and then the concession that all the elements were met is tantamount to what you might call a stipulation or an agreement. Oh, I think it was. I okay. think it. I think it was right. a stipulation. I mean, whether what what precipitated or or the environment that led to the stipulation would they have entered into it, but for the fact that the the certificates were were entered into evidence lawfully and and in you know in basically in conformance with our case law. Are you object? I, I can't remember. Did you? Um, well, first, did counsel object to that instruction? No. No, he was satisfied with it. And is that, to go back to Justice Cordy, is that, are you saying that's ineffective assistance, or you're not saying that? I, I don't think that it is in that context, and I, and I don't because I just, the problem is that the, the trial sort of didn't happen in a vacuum. It happened in sort of a chronology of events that I don't think that the parties or the courts foresaw. Um, and so in that sense, I don't make the argument that he was ineffective for, for agreeing at that point. I think that um, obviously the cocaine was probably more of an afterthought given the fact that the gun charge was, was, was charged as a, uh, as a, under a 10G C. So. But if you, if you, okay, so if you posit the evidence as it is, what he said on the witness stand, and then the judge's instruction, is it, you don't think one can argue? I mean, one could find that it really was harmless beyond a reasonable doubt, the, the, the uh, cocaine certificate? I mean, it, it, in substance, the judge was saying, you don't have to think about this a lot, right? Well, but the, but the burden was never... Focusing on the fact never... that he talked. I'm sorry. I just thought of that. <laughs> that, he, that he, in other words, the judge was pointing the jury to the defendant's testimony. I guess that's what, what I mean. Actually, what precipitated the... The, um, the instruction that you, well, you stipulate that the substance is cocaine was actually defense counsel's closing argument because, in his close, because the judge said in your closing argument you pretty much seem to concede that the substance was cocaine. And, but at that point, it, the, the burden throughout the trial was never on the defendant to prove the nature of the substance. And, I, and, and would, would that burden have been satisfied but for the certificate, and, and I, I understand your argument about the chronology, but you're doing a great job. But the um, the certificates were, although introduced, weren't really f discussed at all in closing. They they were not discussed in the opening or the closing, or mentioned by the but, judge, right? No, they weren't. No, None they of weren't. that reference to the, the language on the certificate. But I would say that both witnesses, both. Sierra and Rodriguez did testify certificate in, in hand as to the content of them. Um, they were entered into evidence we're as entered. exhibits. That's right. And they did presumably go into the jury room so the jury would have been able to look at them during their deliberations. But then there were the instructions that told but, them, don't worry about it. Yes, that's, that's true, Judge. Right. And unless the panel has any other questions, I will rest. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you.
Good morning. May it please the court. I'm Jane Montori representing the Commonwealth in this matter. In determining whether the um, admission of the certificates in this case were harmless error, the court should focus on the defense theory at the trial. The certificates had absolutely nothing to do with the defense's theory at this trial. The sentences that the defendant faced were the driving force. The defendant was charged under Chapter 269 10GC for possession of a firearm as a subsequent offender, which carried a 15 to 20 year penalty. He was also um, charged or uh, liable to be convicted for possession of cocaine, which carried a one year House of Correction sentence, and he'd already been held prior to trial for more than a year. So the avoidance of that 10 GC sentence, I would suggest, was the driving force behind the defense theory at the trial. It had very little, if anything, to do with the certificates of analysis. And I take it the defense was that his possession was, a, was necessary in order to ensure that others didn't get the gun. Yes, and, and he, he conceded. So possession was essentially conceded. He conceded so. possession of the firearm, and I, I would suggest he conceded possession of cocaine that was recovered by medical personnel in front of the police officer in order to attempt to bolster his credibility in front of the jury for his more important defense, which was that of, de of necessity. And he did testify on his own behalf that he took the uh, gun, the handgun, off the table inside the restaurant where shots were being fired and carried it outside. And that's the weapon that he threw up to the railroad tracks. It was the Commonwealth's theory that um, there, there was a video of the inside of the restaurant, a surveillance Found video. It, right? Pardon? He, wasn't he on the video actually taking yes. possession of yes. the gun? Yes, so he, <clears throat> he was shown taking possession of the gun. Um, according to the prosecutor's close, closing, his friend, Mr. Hallett, who eventually um, died of injuries he sustained that night, is seen on the video firing the gun and then putting it on the table. So it was the Commonwealth's theory that, in fact, there were two guns that were involved here, the one that the defendant took off the table and one that the defendant fired outside the restaurant um, as he left uh, carrying his, his friend out. Um, and Trooper Shrine, who testified for the Commonwealth as a rebuttal witness, bolstered the Commonwealth's theory by indicating that, um, first of all, I think this is a case different from Barbosa. I think the um, record shows that Trooper Shrine did have personal knowledge that this weapon, um, which was thrown up onto the railroad tracks eventually, uh, which was Exhibit 7 at the trial, um, did have personal knowledge of test firing. Both he and one of his associates, um, Trooper Crane, um, if they didn't both test fire the weapon, um, if, they, if Trooper Crane didn't test fire the weapon in Trooper Shrine's presence, Trooper Shrine got the discharge casings in order to compare them to the evidence at the scene. So he knew that, the, in fact, this weapon was operable. But even more important was the evidence that um, as the two responding um, officers drove toward the Kennedy fried chicken for shots fired, they heard additional shots being fired. And that would support what Trooper Shrine found, that two handguns, neither of which were Exhibit 7, were fired inside the restaurant, and that additional weapons, including Exhibit 7, were fired outside. In fact, there were, um, in addition to the two or three casings that matched this handgun, there were 17 others. Um, 
So I would in in addition, then the judge told the jury, he removed the issue from the jury of the operability of the weapon. And this was done after trial counsel consulted with his client. The defendant agreed. The judge instructed. He, he did go through the elements of all of the offenses and then told the jury that um, the the part uh, the they didn't have to determine um, whether the Commonwealth satisfied those elements beyond a reasonable doubt that they did satisfy those elements. I said, said that the parties have doubt. agreed that the Commonwealth has indeed satisfied those elements. Yes, and the defendant never objected to the instruction. In fact, he expressed his satisfaction with it. Um, so this was done in the presence of the defendant. Um, after consultation with counsel, the uh, defendant agreed and did not lodge an objection to the instruction. So f- for those three reasons, the um, agreement between the parties, the presence of Trooper Shrine at the test firing, or the personal knowledge of Trooper Shrine at the test firing, and the third is the uh, evidence from Trooper Shrine that the uh, the firearm that the defendant threw up onto the railroad tracks was fired shortly before he threw it, and therefore it was operable. So I would suggest the certificates uh, regarding the operability of the weapon um, had absolutely nothing to do with the jury's verdict in this case. And as to the um, cocaine, the strongest uh, argument for the Commonwealth is, again, the concession that uh, the parties had agreed that the Commonwealth proved all the elements of the offense beyond a reasonable doubt, including that the substance was cocaine. But he, did he say anything about his own knowledge uh, or experience in using cocaine? Or, or No, he didn't. So this was just, it was in my sock, it was mine. He, he, it's he, not, so in that sense, it's not like Mendes. It's not like Mendes, no. Um, that's why I, I argue that the strongest evidence for harmless error as to the cocaine is the um, judge's instruction that removed that factual element from the jury's consideration. And it fit with the defense theory at trial. He was conceding it was cocaine um, to try to get the jury to believe his necessity defense. And the jury received a correct instruction on necessity um, and uh, that the Commonwealth bore the burden to show that it was not necess- not necessary to carry the firearm out of the restaurant. And, and the amount of cocaine was not um, a, a, uh, um, an issue? No, it was just straight possession, just, Your just Honor. Straight possession. I believe he was indicted for... Um, maybe possession with intent to distribute, but then, and it's not in the record, but it was presented to the jury as a straight possession case. Okay. Unless the court has any further questions, I would ask that you affirm the convictions. Thank you, Thank counsel. You counsel. Thank you very much.